All right, sorry about that. So welcome to our second synchronous learning session on the basics of drawing. So before we begin, I'd just like to focus on a portion of your Canvas K-12 LMS. So usually I would divide it into two parts. So the first one would be the content itself. So under the content, you have everything under the web um, HTML format. And we also have the activity. So for your activity, you have your self-check one, which is a quiz. But before you move on to the actual quiz, we have here a practice quiz. So the purpose of this practice quiz is for you to actually kind of like familiarize yourself within the environment of the test taking. So with this one, um, this is not required, but I do recommend that you um, take this quiz first before we actually move on to the actual um, quiz so that you would not have any issues when it comes to internet connectivity and so on and so forth so that's the main purpose for this one as well also another reminder so you are currently being recorded right now so i'd like you to please be on your best behavior when it comes to um keeping your microphone closed if you don't have any questions but if you do have you are open to opening your microphone if necessary so with that one let's focus on with the actual lesson so if you can also have your module or your PDF with you, you can then use it also to reference, but it's not necessary if you can see my screen right now. But if it's quite blurry or if you need um, a little bit more help when it comes to that one, you might just want to focus on the PDF itself. So here we have the basics of drawing. So the main purpose of this lesson is really for us to be able to just um, introduce to introduce the concepts the materials the equipment everything that you essentially need to know before you actually start drawing so in this lesson you will not start drawing next lesson you will so with that one this is a bit more of a preparation so it has a lot of things so you have your materials and equipment criteria um, general steps drawing exercises and um, amongst other things so let's begin first with the materials and equipment in traditional animation so i would like to establish a difference here the materials and equipment that will be presented to you is mostly for traditional animation what we're currently doing right now is more of illustration so under these parts you also have like um substitutes so you don't have to necessarily have every single thing right here however there are some things that you can use for substitutes or of course some things that might be necessary for you to be able to do the illustration these are just some things that you have to know if you would like to become an animator traditionally. So the first one is the light box. So the light box is usually considered as the main workspace of the animator. Um, kind of like um, your devices, probably like a drafting table for engineering or architecture students. So for this one, um, I will mo mostly be skipping these parts right here. But the important part right here is that it's mostly used for animation not necessarily for illustration and it can mostly do something which we call as cleanup and in betweening so these two things are specific activities that you do for animation cleanup is essentially creating the final line in betweening is creating the intermediate frames so with that one we also have other parts like let's say the rotating disc so the rotating disc is this one right here yung the one in color white so it's called a rotating disc because essentially you can kind of remove it from the actual table and you can also rotate it for if you need to like have more precision in terms of cleanup then it's um, possible for you to be able to do that for the rotating disc we also have our pegs so the pegs right here is actually at the bottom so this metal plate thing right here so there are actually three um there are three metallic pieces that are protruding under um over this peg bar so what it's uh, it's supposedly able to do is for you to be able to um, place your animation paper in place so that it would not fall off if in case you're rotating your disc and so on and so forth lastly we have our lead light which is usually placed under the disc and it's used for you to be able to do cleanup and in betweening so an important part of the tasks that you do in animation is for you to be able to see the drawings before it so the easiest way for you to be able to do that is for you to have a lead light under your table and to be able to see it automatically so those are just some things that you have to see in a light box 
um, for us, since we're just mainly focusing on illustration, um, any surface is fine. Your table is fine. Um, your kitchen table is fine. Um, whichever flat surface that you use for drawing, those are fine as well. Next one is the paper. So, of course, wherever you're going to place your outputs or your frames from the sketches to the final line would be placed right here. So the specialized type of paper that we use for animation is something which we call as obviously the animation paper. So it has some unique characteristics. One um, striking feature immediately is this hole right here. So the composition of the holes is quite different to like let's say a normal um, three a normal college notebook. So with that one you have this two flat lines at the sides and one um, circular hole at the center. So this will um, specifically fit your peg bar so that it won't slip all around. Um, the consistency is mostly like bond paper. However, it is usually bigger than a bond paper, like 15 inches by 12 inches. So for you guys, since you're not really going to be using an animation paper, any white colored or by extension light colored, like if you have an off-white paper, those are fine as well with no lines. So the reason why it doesn't have any lines is so that it won't distract the uh, um the entire output of your drawing. So if you have your sketch pad, sketchbook, or bond paper that was discussed previously, then you can use those ones as well. For your pencil, so this is a little bit more complicated, but essentially any working pencil will do. So it doesn't matter what grade, it doesn't necessarily matter what type of brand it is, as long as it's a working pencil, you can more or less use it. Um, if we're going to look more into the very detail, the very nitty-gritty of a pencil, you can have different types of pencils and they have usually different purposes. Like let's say you can have a specific pencil for just sketching. You can also have a specific pencil for just cleanup or creating the final light. So you can also do something like that. So like let's say you would like to have a lighter pencil for you to be able to just sketch. And then later on, if you're going to add the final line, you might want to do um, um, another different lead um, grade pencil, which is a bit darker, so you can use that one. We also have different types of pencil. So we have according to material, which is the graphite or the wooden pencil, or the mechanical pencil right here. So it doesn't matter whatever you're going to choose, as long as it's working, you can use either. However, they do have their own advantages and disadvantages. So it would be better for you to look into them for you to create a good decision. Next one is we also have the grade. So the grade essentially focuses on the thickness or the lightness and darkness rather of a pencil. So if you're just looking at the normal school pencils, like let's say yung um, Mongol pencils or Stabilo pencils in the numbers 1, 2, and 3, that's an entirely different um, grading system for grade LEDs. So those ones are most likely... They're not really significant in terms of lightness. It's more on the quality of the lead. So with that one, um, that's probably something that you don't really have to think of. But if you have like these HBF pencils, then that's a little bit more complicated. Because essentially, what we would like to get is the middle points. So if you have your H, your HB, F, H, 2, H, 3, um, up until 3H even, that's possible for you to be able to use. So for this one, it allows you to kind of lighten it a bit further if you would like to have a sketch. But at the same time, if you would like to have a final drawing, then it is possible for you to just um, darken it a little bit. Um, another thing is that you're going to have different types of grades. So you have your B, which usually means black. So these are the darker ones. If you have a B, I don't really recommend it because it will be very difficult for you to sketch and by extension erase. But it's very easy for you to create the final line. Um, for the H's right here, these are standing for hard because usually the graphite is quite hard. So it's mostly used for sketching because of how light it is. So it is possible for you to use an H pencil. However, if you have like a 4H or something that's quite lighter, um, I don't really recommend it since it's going to be too light already if ever you're going to um, now create the final line. If you had to choose for a pencil, go for something that is lighter compared to something that's darker. Because something lighter 
it's okay for you to kind of build it up but it's going to be very difficult for you to erase something or reduce something if you have a darker tone pencil it's also possible for you to have let's say a 4h pencil for sketching and then a 2b pencil for the final line so as long as you're using a pencil you're good here we also have other materials so you have your eraser of course um for you to be able to erase different things within the page um another important thing when it comes to the pencil i mean to the eraser is that we don't really use it as often we only use it at the very final portion wherein we're going to erase our guidelines but like let's say when you're sketching when you're doing um the final line more or less you're not really going to use this as often so more or less you'll be overdrawing something which means that you'll just be drawing over it and then erasing it later, which is a bit more efficient. We also have your sharpener if you need a sharpener. And of course, ruler, protractor, or French curve. You don't really need the other two. If you would like to, you can also get a ruler for the later activities. Next one, we have the criteria and character drawing. So if ever going to um, give activities, you would usually see the following as the criteria for character drawing. So it's really important that you gauge how you do your activities based on the following criteria. So that number one, you would be able to learn it as quickly as possible. And number two, of course, you can have a higher grade than um, a higher, the highest possible grade that you can. So the first one is proportion. So proportions essentially, so you can see it like right here. Um, one of the most famous examples is the illustration of Leonardo da Vinci, wherein essentially how um, your measurement of different body parts is. So it's the sizing of the characters, the sizing of the head, the entire body, the sizing of the head in relation to the arms, the sizing of the legs in relation to the head, and so on and so forth. So usually, when we're looking at different, um, yeah, when we're looking at proportions, we need to have a unit of measurement. So usually what we would do is that we would have other um, body parts as reference for the other body parts. So like, let's say when we're drawing different parts of the face, you might want to use your eye as your basis. But more often than not, we would always use the head as the reference point. So based from the head, you would then create body parts that are shorter or bigger compared to that of the head. So for example, um, the typical height of a superhero character would usually be around eight heads. So for that one, it would either, um, that would be four heads for the head up until the torso and then four heads for the legs. So that's just something that we use as a unit of measurement. So if ever you need to counter check something, we would usually use the head for that one. Next one is the use of basic shapes. So for proportions, it's more on the sizing. Now you need to add a little bit of volume and you can use that through basic shapes. So using basic shapes compared to just immediately going for it and then rendering has a lot of advantages. So number one, it creates the initial volume. So when we say initial vo volume, you're essentially creating the foundations, similar to that of creating your proportions first. So when you're creating an initial volume, number one, it's easier for you to correct it at that stage. It's very hard for you to kind of correct your proportions or your basic shapes if you are rendering already. So that's something that we would like to prevent is for you to do the corrections as early as the basic shapes and then not worry so much about it during the rendering process and then of course it will allow for better construction it allows you to kind of understand how to do it easier instead of just focusing on like let's say okay this is the shape of the eye at least if you have these fundamental shapes it's easier for you to understand and therefore recreate it Next one, it allows for better consistency. So with this one, it would be easier for you to do an eye correctly every single time, a face correctly every single time. So we will be seeing later on when we're going to discuss a lot of these different body parts that every single part of our body is actually created by these basic shapes. If the shape is too complicated, you can then further break it down to more simpler shapes. We usually just use your circles, rectangles, um, ellipses, and 
um, triangle. So, very basic shapes lang talaga. Next one is we have the rendering. So, rendering is essentially the addition of details to the final drawing to make it more realistic and appealing. So, for this portion, your basic shapes and your proportions, you essentially have an idea of what the character is, what it's supposed to look like, but you shouldn't really leave it at that. Because if you just leave it at the basic shapes, then you have all of these guidelines that are unnecessary. And also, you won't be able to add the things that actually make a drawing or an illustration more appealing. So, of course, you have the detailing. You have um, adding, like, let's say, hair strands, adding eyelashes, ad adding hairs on the eyebrows, adding some shading if you need to do some shading. But we won't really do any shading at this subject. So usually it takes up the longest time, but if you have your foundations right, if you have your proportions and basic shapes done correctly, it's usually the easiest thing to do. And at this portion, you are allowed to be a bit more creative compared to that of your basic shapes and your proportions, which may take a little bit more technicalities. So when you render, of course, you help with the overall appeal of the character. So how good it looks, how um, unique it looks, how striking it looks as an audience member. And then lastly, we have appeal. So usually, we don't really see the term rendering. You'll actually only be seeing that one towards the first portions of how you're going to draw the human face, all of those things. But mostly, you would be seeing something called as appeal. Because for you to be able to get an appeal, you have to do some rendering. Appeal usually refers to how impactful a character is and it's designed to the audience. So think about it as if you have a live-action character or if you have an actor or an, or an actress, you're usually drawn to them because of their charisma. Not necessarily because they look physically appealing, but they might have something that's quite unique to them for the characters. So for live-action characters, it's almost a requirement for you to be somewhat physically appealing. But for your animated cartoon characters, as long as it's something, they can provide something unique to the table, that is an example of an appeal. So you don't really see it um, something that's quite often. So that's mostly what we're talking about right here. So the next portion is the general steps in character drawing. So for character drawing, we tend to follow the basic steps. So for this one, the goal for this is for you to essentially, first of all, establish your foundations before you move on to the rendering. So when you're establishing your foundations, it makes it easier for you to correct yourself. And at the same time, um, if you're going to move on with the rendering stages, you can then easily move on. So as I've stated a while ago, it's easier for you to do changes in the skeleton and in the basic shapes compared to that of the rendering. Because if you're going to correct something within the rendering process, that would mean that you would have to sometimes recreate everything from scratch. So the first general step that we have, um, by the way, this um, are usually just general steps. So of course, it might not be, ap be applicable for everything. So like when you're creating an eye, you don't really need the skeleton. You can just immediately move on to the basic shapes. But you can have, you can still kind of see a semblance to it. So it's almost applicable for everything, but it cannot be applicable to every single thing that you have. So we have our skeleton. Skeleton is essentially the lightest or the very first thing that you do when you draw. Um, as you can see right here, it's essentially a more complicated type of stickman, wherein you are asked to draw all of these lines, all of these circles, or just dots even sometimes. So the purpose for you... Um, to do this is for you to establish the proportions. So if you have a good set of proportions, you can then now move on to the basic shapes. So having a good skeleton establishes your proportions. And if you don't have a good proportions, then your basic shapes would not really good as look good as well. Because for the basic shapes, what you're essentially doing is that you're adding more shape to the measurement already. So if your measurement isn't good, then your basic shape would not also look good. So usually you would have lines for the main portions of your body, like your arms, your legs, your torso, your head, and your joints would usually be represented by circles. Your joints can even be represented by just dots. 
So you can see a lot of measuring going on. Um, later on, you'll be seeing that I would be using the head a lot as a measurement or a basis of measurement. So that's something that you will have to consider when you're creating something like this. Next one is the use of the basic shapes. So the basic shapes, as you can see right here, you can kind of still see um, the general body already. But at the same time, you can also see that it's broken down into something that's simple. So let's look at, like, let's say the torso, for example. So for the torso, you can see right here that you can see that it's a torso. You can see where the chest is. You can see where the waist is. You can see where the hips are. However, if you actually look into it very closely, you can see that it's actually made out of um, different types of shapes. So you have this half circle right here. Your waist is essentially a circle. This thing right here is kind of like an hourglass shape, which um, breaking it down even further, you can somewhat create two triangles or one triangle and then one rectangle. This underwear shape or pentagon shape thing right here is essentially a triangle and a rectangle. So you can kind of create these different shapes and mix and match them together to create the final character. So immediately you see what the character should look like, but at the same time, this is not the final step. The final step can be something which we call as rendering. Rendering is essentially the finalization of your basic shapes, addition of the details that you need, adding clothing, and even erasing your guidelines and your basic shapes. So you can just have this as the final result as well. So we have another additional step which we call as cleanup. So cleanup is creating the final line for the drawing. So the rendering and the cleanup may not be mutually um, inclusive so they're usually exclusive of each other because rendering is you don't you try to create a final line of some sorts but you don't really care about the quality of the line so does it matter to you that you have more creation of lines around the leg area right here compared to that of the leg not necessarily but for a cleanup line you have to make sure that every single line would have the same thickness they would have the same darkness they would have um, a uniform approach, whereas for rendering, it's not really necessary. So we won't really be focusing on cleanup because that's more for animation 12a. So it's okay for us to kind of just like stop here and erase any guidelines that you might want to see. Um, next portion that we're going to have is now factors in drawing lines. So again, Drawing lines is mostly used for your proportions, and when you're creating lines, that's your foundations for your basic shapes. So for this one, um, it's really important for you to kind of figure this out because um, this is where we find you can kind of see some potential in terms of the artistry compared to someone who is mostly just doing this for the sake of passing a requirement. So how you um, create your lines would then create um, an establishment of how you're going to proceed with this drawing exercises. So we have quite a number. We have control, angle, pressure, and speed. So let's focus on the very first one, which is control. So control essentially is how you kind of move, how you hold your pencil, how you maneuver a pencil. So we have two parts right here. We have our grip and we have our maneuver. So how you hold and how you maneuver a pencil also establishes other factors when you're drawing your lines. So like let's say how you hold your pencil would determine how dark your pencil could look like. So we have our types of pen holds or pen grips. So we have the most common one which is the traditional grip. So the traditional grip essentially is how you would hold a pencil when you're writing something. So you can also use that for drawing as well. There's not really a distinct way for you to be able to draw. There's not a requirement on how you would hold a pencil. So as long as you're comfortable with something, you can either use the following. And usually, a lot of our students would be using the traditional grip. We also have other parts like we have the drumstick, paintbrush, tip heavy, and inverted grip. And there are a lot more grips that were not showcased right here. But essentially, what's important is for you to be able to hold your pencil steadily. You're able to control it, add more pressure, add a little bit more pressure, 
So with those ones, um, you can kind of modify it from there. So for example, there are some things on how you would um, maneuver your pencil. So maneuvering your pencil is then moving your pencil around the paper itself. So for me to be able to demonstrate this, um, it would be better for me to just showcase how much lines I am able to create. So I have right here a digital drawing tool. So for you guys, you're not really allowed to use this, but for demonstration purposes, it would be easier for me to just place it right here. So right here, um, I'll be using different parts of my arm to be able to draw different types of lines. So I'll be creating mostly, um, yeah, let's try to create horizontal lines. So the first thing that I'm mostly manipulating is my fingers. So when you're manipulating your fingers, it's just moving certain parts of your joints. So you're not really moving your elbow. You're not moving anything else. It's just that you're moving your fingers. So when you're creating horizontal lines with just your fingers, you can kind of see that how I create those lines is a bit shorter. Um, however, I tend to have more control for this one. So like, let's say if I want to create something that's slightly more, um, yeah, that's slightly straighter, then I can use my fingers for that one. If I'm creating longer lines um, using different parts of my arm, then that might be a little bit more difficult. So another important thing that I can do with this one is that I can also change the pressure of the drawing. So like, let's say I can create like these really thin lines. I can also create these really thick lines by just focusing on my fingers. So just having light lines, these uh, medium-sized lines, and also just dark lines all over. We also have the movement of the wrist. So the movement of the wrist is, again, moving your wrist, not necessarily your fingers, for you to create longer lines. So usually when we're writing, we tend to use more of this one. So uh, in conjunction with your fingers, and this is something that you might also be using more commonly when you're drawing. So for this one, if you would like to draw something a bit bigger, not necessarily precision drawing, you might want to use a wrist, um, your wrist. So if you're already seeing right here, the differences on the spacing for my lines right here is more consistent for the fingers. But if I'm doing it right here for the wrist, you can see that I have some straightaways right here. So with those ones, it's not as um, it's not as precise. However, you can very much clearly see that I have created three times more length of a line by just using my wrist. So what if you use something else? Now let's move on to the elbow. So for the elbow, you might want to have a little bit more table room for this one. So it is recommended that you have your elbow on the table, but it's also possible for you to just move your elbow around. So when you're using your elbow, you tend to use it to rotate. So for this one, as you can see, right now I'm using my elbow. I have created now a line that's twice, maybe thrice, as long as the one in the wrist. So as you can see also right here that I tend to have lesser control. So for this one, you can still see a semblance of straighter lines. For this one, you can only see it at the first one. So if you would like to create um, bigger drawings, like let's say the skeleton of your drawing, when you're drawing it on paper, then you might want to use your elbow as well. Lastly, for the shoulder. So for the shoulder, um, usually I would use this if I'm presenting something on the board. For you guys, you might not use this as often, but it might be something good for you to exercise because you can essentially create really long lines with this. So... Um, you need a little bit of headroom for this and you're essentially going to be moving your shoulder. And with this one, I am able to create sa pinakababa lines as far as the entire page. So from edge to edge, nakakagawa ako ng mga linya. Whereas if I'm doing it with my wrist right here, I can just mostly do around half a page, maybe three quarters of a page. But if I'm using my shoulder, I can move through the entire page. So like, let's say if you want to create really long lines, if you want to create an edge-to-edge -edge type of line, you might want to use your shoulders. So here are some things that you might have to notice. So, of course, um, the more progressive that you move on, you tend to see that you can create a longer line. But an important thing right here is that your position also drops. 
So that's something that is to be expected, but you're not really supposed to just be satisfied with that. So you can still kind of like um improve your it, you can still kind of improve your position net and for the wrists, for the elbows, for the shoulders. You are recommended to do that because if you have more um stability with how you would draw your lines, of course, that would be lesser erasures and that would be more efficiency for your time. So that is for your how you're going to maneuver your pencil. So we have different GIFs on how you can do that. Next portion is we have pressure. So pressure usually refers to the amount of how heavy or how light a pencil is. So if I'm going to do it in my um, pen right here, so I can start off with just having like a normal line. You can also see that I have portions of my line, which is a bit lighter than others. And I can slowly move on by just creating starting to get darker and darker. So aside from getting darker and darker, I also have lines right here which it starts thin and then it gets thicker suddenly. So with this one, I can create as thick lines as possible by adding more pressure to my fingers. But if I don't have a lot of pressure on my fingers, then I can create these really light, really thin lines. So how do you usually create um, light, um, different types of pressure? By the way, when we're drawing something, it's much more recommended that you have a lighter pressure on your pencil. So when you're drawing something, it's really recommended that you make it as light as possible. So if you're going really dark, it's really difficult for you to erase something. So the lighter pressure, the better. So how do you create a lighter line pressure? So um, the basic thing that you can do is mostly it's depending on the weight of your fingers and how tense your fingers are. So if your fingers are relaxed, you can get a lighter line pressure. But if your fingers are tense, you would have a darker line pressure. Another important thing is probably you can hold your pencil a bit farther away from your tip. So if you have like, let's say your pencil tip right here. Um, let's have, for example, let me just erase it a little bit. Okay, so probably you have your pencil right here. Just a um, silhouette of it. So usually when you have your pencil, you probably might hold it right around here, very close to the tip of the pencil right here. You might want to move a bit higher. So if you have like those pencil guards, you go at the very top of it or even beyond that. So probably if you have your guard thing right here and your finger would be around here, probably the very tip or the very edge of your finger would probably be around here. So with that one, you automatically kind of lighten the pressure on your of your pencil. Another one is if you're using a mechanical pencil, you might want to use a longer lead. So for that one, like let's say when you're create when you're using a mechanical pencil, probably the size of your lead might be a bit smaller. So usually maganyensha. But if you want to probably make it a bit longer you tend to be a bit more cautious of it, so you won't want to break it. So automatically, you would have a lighter pen pressure. And then we also have lifting the tip of the pencil away from the paper surface. So if you don't um, want to draw on the paper, then try to have it further away from your paper. So having a lighter pencil pressure is better than having a darker pencil pressure, as we've stated a while ago. Next one is we have angle. So angle mostly focuses on the types of lines and how you would draw them. Of course, that would also determine the direction of the line and by extension, the quality of the line. So um, another important part pala is when it comes to, by the way, having your pressure and having the quality of your lines, your control or how you grip your pencil is really important. So like, yeah, you need to have a lighter pen pressure, but it's also quite difficult for a challenge or it's quite difficult for you to create a straighter line so like let's say if i have a light um a normal line pressure i can create like these straighter lines but if i am creating it with as light pressure as possible there would be a tendency that i can kind of create more diagonal lines shorter lines that i've expected and so on and so forth so for me i've kind of like um you don't really see a lot of difference but when you're a beginner, usually it would most likely be 
looking like this so you would go a bit slower you might not have like just a diagonal line you would even have shorter lines if possible so you can get a lot of things or a lot of mistakes wrong if you don't have the proper um grip and maneuver that's why we've i've constantly been saying over and over again have the proper pencil grip that also applies towards your line so whenever you're drawing something like let's say when you're drawing your horizontal line when you're drawing it you might have a more horizontal line like this but vertical line there might be some instances na some of you might be a bit more diagonal so ang ginagawa natin is that we would have to rotate our pens um our paper and then create that horizontal line so kailangan natin i-rotate for a little bit then create that horizontal line then reset it now you have a vertical line for some of you baka mas magaling kayo sa vertical line so pag gumawa kayo ng horizontal line is that it's not as straight so we also have your different curved lines right here the important part when it comes to angle is that you're not really recommended to rotate your paper because if you're rotating your paper that's a waste of time so with this one try to practice to create different types of lines without changing the direction of your paper so most likely it would be your own hand your own arm on adjusting it so that you would be able to create these different types of lines without really rotating or adjusting your paper and then i think the last portion of this part is speed so for speed this focuses more on how fast the lines or how um, fast the drawings are drawn so this is usually the least important part because you need to be able to exercise control and then pressure and angle and then speed last because it's okay for you to draw a bit slower but if you draw really fast but sloppy then that's something entirely else but when you're creating um when you're creating your lines you tend to have better lines when you're drawing a bit quickly compared to something a bit more slowly so like let's say if i were to create a um, horizontal line right now i have something that's quite fast so you have something like that but if i have a if i want to create a horizontal line but it's a bit slower then tendency you would have like these um rivets within the line which is not necessarily good when you're trying to create a really good line so having faster lines makes it more efficient for you to draw and at the same time you can have better looking lines compared to just like um kind of dragging it out when you're creating your different lines but then again um please focus more on the other three factors rather than speed speed comes last so you can take a longer amount of time for you to be able to finish your work but as long as that work is a bit higher quality then you can um, forgo with the speed for now but later on as you progress within your drawing skill or when you're practicing you have to be able to do something like this so that um you would be able to do activities faster and more efficiently so last portion um yeah next portion is we have drawing basic shapes so for drawing basic shapes now we're going to move on to how important basic shapes are and how volume is so when it comes to basic shapes it actually focuses on measurement so measurement actually makes your proportions look sensible so even though you have the proper proportions but if you don't have the proper volume then that essentially means that your drawing won't look as good um so for this one in animation kasi it's important for you to be able to draw the same character over and over consistently and not something do something which we call as off modeling um off model ibig sabihin they don't really look the same so here we have an example um yeah for those who aren't really familiar i think final season in attack on titan and here we have one of the characters right here um, i chose this character specifically because he has this reputation of not aging so as you can see even though not technically this is the same character if you actually um try to look into it this is a span of one year the first and the second picture that's one year and then from the second picture to the third picture that's i think like three years so you can see a very huge shift in how the character is drawn so technically they are the same character but how they look is very different so in this case 
it's different because there's a change in studio and a change in season. But if you do this, like let's say big lang episode one ito, and then suddenly you have episode two right here, it doesn't really look good in terms of how you create your characters. Because when you have um, inconsistencies when you're creating your characters, it won't really have that appeal. So how could you get a character appeal without having proper consistency? So that's what we essentially mean by how important measurement is and how important having consistency is. So when you're creating your basic shapes, we do have also factors, but they're um, a little bit less. Um, you have to also learn first the factors on drawing lines before you have this thing right here. So the first portion is we have measurement. So when we're measuring 2D shapes, you need two dimensions. The one horizontal one is we have your width. The one vertical is we call your height. Every single basic shape that's two-dimensional should have a width and should have a height. So to give you more of an example right here, let's try to make other basic shapes. So like let's say we have a triangle. So when you're creating your triangle, you have your width right here, which is more horizontal. And you have your height right here, which is vertical. When you're creating a circle, so it doesn't have to be like a perfect circle, but essentially... Your width is this one, your height is this one. You don't really see, if you, even if you create like these really complicated shapes like, um, sabi natin an octagon. So when you're creating an octagon, of course, you have different other measurements of it, like your perimeter area and so on and so forth. But essentially, you can then enclose it into a rectangle or a square and then have your width and then you have your height. So every single 2D measurement would have this one right here but what if let's say you have something that's three-dimensional so if you have something that's three-dimensional then usually you would have some something which we call as thickness or depth so that's your third dimension we don't really use the terminology length for this one right here so again we use width height and depth or thickness so every single um shape has this dimension so this is really important because how you construct your width and your height would then be focusing on proportions next one is the line composition so line composition mostly focuses on the number of lines that you use to create a shape the construction and the overall line quality so if you were to ask me it's more important that your measurement is on point compared to that of your line composition However, your line composition would also dictate the quality of your rendering. So the better your line composition is, the lesser work you have to do for rendering because essentially you're just going to trace something. But if your line composition is not good, then that would also dictate how you would do your rendering. So pag hindi siya maganda, then your rendering might not be as good. So we have, for example, our head right, um, our circle right here. So when you're creating a circle, you don't have to create a perfect circle, so to speak. So we have our checked mark circle right here. If you actually analyze it a bit better, you can kind of see that how rounded the upper left quadrant we have right here is not as um, rounded compared to that of the other sides. So it's not technically a perfect circle, but it has the right beats. So you have the right measurements, your width and your height. You also have how rounded it is. It's quite similar. And of course, I've used um, as, fewer, as fewer lines as possible for me to be able to create something like this. Um, the one incorrect right here is that you can obviously see that no care has been done to create how round a circle is. And if you have multiple lines, it would be very distracting and it would be very difficult for you to erase later on. Next portion is you have, of course, your rectangle right here. So it doesn't really have to look good. It doesn't have to look perfect. It doesn't have to look exactly straight. But if it's diagonal and it's wrong in terms of its measurement, then it doesn't really do its job as a proper basic shape. The last portions are here if, is we have pressure and speed. So essentially, it calls for the same things. So for pressure... You must draw it as light as possible and also no overdrawing of light. So overdrawing is more of this point right here, wherein you're drawing a line over an existing line already without any purpose. So you will be seeing um, later on that 
as I've stated a while ago, we don't really erase something. We usually over draw a line over it. So if you would need to have a correction, you can draw a line over it, but draw as little lines as possible. For speed again, it's the last factor to consider. However, please draw lightly and it's better for you to draw the shapes as quickly as possible because it's something that you'll be erasing anyway. So if you take so much time in perfecting how round the circle is or how good the measurement of the rectangle is, you're essentially wasting time. We also have here solid drawing. So I won't be focusing so much on this one, but essentially for your solid drawing, it's the idea of thinking that even though a shape is two-dimensional, you have to think of it as three-dimensional so that when you have these different shifts in perspective, you won't have so much of a difference. Lastly, we have our drawing exercises. So for drawing exercises, medyo, um, let's try to extend a little bit more. But for your drawing exercises, it's really important for you to do these ones. You're not really, I'm not really requiring you to do this or show me the results of your activities but in goodwill i will be asking you to do this at your own time before you actually start drawing so the first part is hand and arm stretches so you have to stretch your arm you have to stretch your hand before and after each drawing session particularly if you're going to be drawing for three hours four hours um, similar to when you're doing exercises if you overexert a muscle you might be getting some issues in the future like let's say aching muscles and you don't really want to get carpal tunnel syndrome. So here we have um, a short infographic on how you would stretch. You might have your own different ways on how you would stretch. Those would work as well. As long as you're able to relax or you're able to warm up your muscles and then relax your muscles after drawing, then it's something that you might want to do. Another consideration is that if you want to have proper eye support, proper back support, proper environment support, then that's something that you might want to consider as well. For your materials and equipment, when you're doing these exercises, just use a stable enough pencil. I don't really recommend that you use a mechanical pencil um, because it might break off a bit easier. So just have your normal wooden pencil. But if you just have your mechanical pencil, you can use that one as well. And also scrap paper. Scrap paper because a lot of the things that you'll be doing is more or less junk. So you might want to throw them away later. So the first thing that you would need to focus on is something which we call as pencil grip and pencil control. So for you to be able to do that, you need to be able to draw a circle. So this circle, it's really important that you draw them in different ways. So different sizes, because different sizes would um, practice different portions of your arm. So like, let's say if I create a small circle like this, I'm just focusing on my fingers. If I create a circle more of like this one right here, this is more of my wrist. I mean my, um, yeah, my wrist, a bigger portion of my wrist. Now I'm focusing on my elbow right here and then lastly your shoulder. So as you can see right here, um, these are some things that you have to focus on when you're creating something like this. The circle doesn't have to be perfect, but try to make an effort to do so. And for you to be able to do that, make sure that you're overdrawing something. So try to create as perfect circle as possible every single time. If you're creating your circle like this, you're just not caring about how the composition of your circle is. You're essentially kind of defeating the purpose because you want to be able to create a perfect circle. Another thing is that this is a warm up exercise. So you can go as light as you can. You can go as dark as you can. So if you want to create a lighter circle, you're good to go with that one. If you want to suddenly go dark with your circle, you can do that. If you want to go light again, then you can do something like that. Um, an important part of this one is that you need to be able to do this at the very per first part. Usually, we recommend that you do this five minutes um, every day. If not five minutes, ten minutes. Actually, for our animation students who undergo um, actual animation training, their trainer would usually ask them to do it for 15 minutes at least. We also have here something which we call for line pressure. So I've been doing this previously. So um, an important thing that you can do for line pressure is for you to create different lines within the piece of your paper. So for this one, I'm not adjusting my um, modifications, my settings. What I'm just doing is that I'm just adding certain points of pressure. 
So I might want to create a line that is a bit lighter. So as you can see right here, it doesn't really have to look really straight. But as long as I'm focusing on the pressure, that's fine. So I want probably to create something that's a bit darker. Something that's a bit darker right here. Then you can suddenly go darker and darker and darker. Um, another thing that you might want to do is for you to be able to create one line, one wavy line. You start off with something that's really light and then you suddenly get darker and then eventually you get to the hardest that you possibly can. So you just have one line but you have different points of pressure. So you can do it from light to dark. You can also do something from dark. Suddenly it gets lighter and lighter or you have this more consistent pressure. For your line angle, um, you can actually do a lot of things. So the first one is for you to take a spare paper and then fill it up with different lines. So I can fill it up with different horizontal lines and then I can now move on to my um, vertical lines. Make sure that I'm getting the entire page of the paper. It doesn't really have to look as straight. So as you can see right here, I kind of like bellow a little bit around this area. Pair as much as possible, you need to be able to fill up the entire page. So if you don't fill up the entire page, it's kind of like a necessity for this drawing exercise. So you can do um, horizontal lines, vertical lines, diagonal lines as much as you can without rotating the paper. That's an important part. Do not rotate the paper because it's allowing you to kind of like cheat, which is not really the purpose of this drawing exercise. So make sure that you're not rotating your paper. Your arm, your fingers, every portion of your arm should be adjusting to the paper itself. Nextly, um, another one is that for you to be able to create a series of parallel lines. So these series of parallel lines is something more of a feathered or a tapered look. So you start off with a harder line and then suddenly at the very end it becomes softer and softer. So the technique that we're calling for this one is tapered or feathering. And the way that you do that is you tend to flick your wrist. So um, imagine when you're checking papers. So it's kind of like that one. However, you do it in different lines. So you have your horizontal lines, you have your vertical lines, you have your diagonal lines, and so on. Then you would kind of morph this one into more curved lines. So you would create curved lines like this curved lines like this, curved lines sa pataas, curved lines doing that. So that you would now be able to focus on a lot of things. So first of all, you have your control and your you have your pressure and your line angle. So I've created a curved line right here. But for my control, I will have to create these two lines and then connect them together. So yeah, you can see right here na hindi siya talaga nag-click. There might be some na baka mag overextend, but as much as possible, we have to make sure that you, you're essentially meeting them at the same time at the very end. So you can have those ones. So these are fine. You might not want this. You might not want this. So if you are able to practice this one, you can then create different hair strands. So your hair strands natin, you might want to have different varying shapes. So usually that's the basic premise of it. Just having these two lines and then connecting them together. That's the way on how you would create really convincing hair. So I think that's it when it comes to my presentation for today. Um, make questions po ba tayo that you might want to ask right now? So you can use your chat. You can use your microphone. Um, okay, I guess there are no questions for now. Um, apologies for the really long time that we take. We took medyo over time tayo. Anyway, if you have any questions, please let me know through your messenger or through email so that I can answer it as quickly as possible. So hopefully you are able to learn a little bit about what we're going to be doing for the basics of drawing. Again, reminder sa mga hindi nakapasok ng medyo maaga, you have two quizzes right here. The first one is a practice quiz. So yung practice practice quiz natin dito, it's not graded, but it's required for you to answer, for you to be able to understand the flow and the environment of what you're going to be taking before you move on to your self-check one. 
Yung practice quiz, you can do this over and over and over again as much as you need. But for the self-check one, that will be only done once. Wala siyang time limit. And you will be using true or false for your self-check one. So that ends my presentation for today. Thank you so much for coming in. And I will be seeing you during the next synchronous learning session. Bye, everyone.